In this lecture, I'll tell you about branches of inverse functions. So here's a definition. Given an analytic function f, defined on some open set u, so we'll always assume our sets are open, we say that a function g, defined on another open set d, but mapping into u, is a branch of f inverse in d, provided that g is continuous and satisfies that f of g of z is z for all z. So here's the picture. f maps the set u somehow into the complex plane. We don't really know where it maps it to. Now suppose you can find a set d here in the image such that I can find the function g that maps this said d into you, not onto, but maybe into you. Okay. If so, and if in addition this function satisfies that whenever I pick a point z in d, follow it with g, so here's g of z, and then map it back with f, I end up where I started. So f of g of z is z for all z and d. So g is some kind of inverse of f, obviously. So if that is possible, then g is called a branch of f inverse. And very important is this condition here that g needs to be continuous in order to be called a branch of inverse of f. So let's look at an example. Suppose f is the function z squared. So we know that it maps the complex plane to the complex plane. And I can find several different branches of inverse for this function. One of them is the regular principal branch of the square root function. So that is the square root where I choose the argument between negative pi and pi and divide that in half. So remember how the square root was defined. Square root of z being the principal branch of the square root function is the absolute value of z to the, and the, the square root, I was going to say to the one half, but the square root of the absolute value of z times e to the i times you take the principal argument of z and divide that into. So if you do that, then all your arguments are going to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 once after you divide them by 2, which means you're mapping into the right half plane. So here's the picture f itself maps the whole plane to the whole complex plane. This is f. But I can choose a function g, which is the square root functions. If I just exclude the negative real axis, I take this out of the picture, then the square root is well defined and maps all of this into just the right half plane over here. Because arguments get divided in two. So an argument of almost negative pi becomes an ar argument of almost negative pi over two. So I end up in the right half plane. And similarly, I can look at this function h, which is minus square root of z. So I'm gonna draw a very similar picture again. Here is the, right, the complex plane and f is defined there, maps it into the complex plane. But now I could restrict myself to the same set that I restricted myself before. So I again take out the negative real axis. That makes the function square root of c defined, but I put a negative sign in front of it. So this time I'm going to map the whole complex plane minus the negative real axis into the left half plane. But once I square negative square root of z, the negative sign goes away under squaring, and the outcome again is z. So again, it is true that f of h of z which is simply negative root z quantity squared is also z squared and so indeed h is also an inverse of f. So here's a theorem and we're going to prove this theorem. The theorem is that if f is analytic and g, a branch of f inverse, just like we 
just discussed. And we pick a point Z0 such that its image, we call that W0, the image on the G. If F prime is non-zero, then G is differentiable at this point Z0, and we can find its derivative as 1 over F prime. So again, let me draw a quick picture to make this clearer. So remember we had D, which gets mapped by F into the complex plane. Oh, I'm sorry, this is u. This is not d, this is u. It's probably an eraser function, but I don't know how to do that, so u. Then we find this region over here, which we call d, on which my branch of f inverse is defined, so we call that g. And finally, I'm going to have a point in here. I'm sorry, I'm going to have a point over here. Here's my z0. And I'm going to follow that point under G. So here's G of Z0. And I also call that W0. Now if the function f has a non-zero derivative at this point W0, then I can find the derivative at the point Z0 over here by saying G prime of Z0 is 1 over F prime at W0. And so I'll show you why this is the case. I'm going to have to erase this picture so that I have enough room to write here. So why is this true? Well, I need to look at the difference quotient and show that it has a limit. So I need to look at g of z minus g of c0 and divide that by z minus c0. Now my z is close to my z0. So in my picture, remember, we were over here in this region D, and Z0 was a point over here, that's C0. And we're going to let Z approach C0, so I, I can assume Z is close enough to Z0, so that it's also in D. Okay, so here's my Z. And therefore, I should have not erased my picture really, therefore, under G, this lands in U which was pink, I think. Okay, I'm recreating my picture. There we go. So here is this region G of D. And there is my G of C0. Why is it not marking? There we go. This is G of C0. And this is G of Z. All right. So... Let me rewrite what I just have. So this is g of z minus g of z0. But instead of dividing by z minus z0, my z can be written because g is a branch of f inverse. z0 is equal to f of g of z0. And the same is true for z. So I'm going to write this kind of complicated as f of g of z minus f of g of c0. And now that I have that, I'm going to just introduce some new notation. Instead of writing g of z and g of c0, this thing here I'm going to call that w. This I already called w0 earlier. So then the numerator becomes w minus w0. So these are just the points over here in, in u. I'm, I'm giving them new names. And in the denominator, instead of g of z again, I'm going to write w minus f of w0. So this is an f right here. And now remember, we want to let z approach z0. What does that mean? I write everything in terms of w's now. As z approaches z0, what happens to my w's? So as z approaches z0, because g is continuous, remember we want to g... In order to call g a branch of inverse, we said it had to be continuous. So as z approaches g0, g of z, which is our w, I really wanted that to be green. Oh, here we go. So g of z is w, and g of z0 is w0. So as z approaches c0, w really approaches w0. And since that's happening, 
I see the reciprocal of the difference quotient for f. And thankfully, I assume that the derivative of f is non-zero at w0. And so it's okay to write 1 over f prime of w0, because I'm getting the reciprocal of the difference quotient here. And that's what I wanted to show. So now I want to give you an example, namely inverses of the exponential function. Those are branches of the logarithm function. So recall that we said that for an analytic function f, another function g is a branch of f inverse if g is continuous and satisfies f of g of z is c. So that was our definition of being a branch of the inverse function. We're now going to apply that to the logarithm function. So suppose f, well this is supposed to be a other c here. So that f be the exponential function. We know the derivative again is e to the z and so it's never equal to zero. And so we know that any branch of, inver of f inverse is therefore analytic. Because the only thing we needed in that previous theorem was for the derivative to be non-zero so that we could actually divide by it. So this prompts our definition. A branch of logarithm in a domain D is an analytic function L such that L is an inverse of the exponential function. So E to the L of C is Z for every Z in D. We didn't really have to assume analytic. It would have been en enough to assume continuous because we just showed continuity implies analyticity as long as the derivative of the original function is non-zero and all that is satisfied. But we might just as well write analytic right here. So a branch of logarithm is an analytic function that sort of undoes the exponential function. And we even know what, it, the, der what the derivative is going to be. The derivative of such a function L is 1 over e to the L of c, just by our previous theorem. The previous theorem told us that g prime of z was 1 over f prime of w, and w is f of z. I'm sorry, w, w is g of z. And so that's what we just used. f is our exponential function, f prime of z is e to the z, and we're plugging in g of z, which is l of z in our case. So e, 1 over e to the l of z is 1 over z. So we also know that we studied points w for which e to the w is equal to z. And we know l of z has to be one of the logarithms of z. Now remember, logarithms are not unique for complex numbers. So we had found logarithms, and I'll just remind you what they are. We had found that log z is the natural log of the absolute value of z plus i times some argument of z. And any such number satisfies that e to the logarithm of z is equal to z. And those are all the numbers. There are no other numbers that satisfy that e to the w is equal to z. They're all of this form. But this is non-unique because the argument here is non-unique. So this is kind of a multi-valued function, but I just wrote down. So we know this L of z has to be some kind of logarithm for some choice of log z. In addition, we need that function uppercase L to be continuous in order to be a branch of logarithm. And so as soon as we find a continuous choice of logarithm in a given domain, we know that choice is analytic and it is a branch of logarithm. We also know that 0 cannot be in D because e to the z is never equal to 0. So 0 is not in the range of the exponential function. And so, as I just said before, uppercase L of z has to be the natural log of z plus i times some choice of arguments. So theta of z is now an actual function. It's a choice of argument of z that is continuous in this region D. So as soon as you can find this con as soon as you can find this continuous choice, you're dealing with a logarithm. So let's look at some examples. Suppose D is again the whole complex plane minus the negative real axis. So we take the negative real axis out. In this region, we know that uppercase argument of Z is a continuous function. Therefore, 
natural log of the absolute value of z plus i times argument of z is a continuous function that satisfies that e to the l of z is equal to z, and therefore it is a branch of logarithm, which is therefore analytic. Another example, we could look at d being the complex plane c, but we take out the positive real axis. So now we need a new choice of argument that is continuous in this new region. So we kind of need our argument starting here, and as we walk around, it just increases, increases, increases until we get here. So we can't have to jump on the negative real axis. So how do you do that? Well, we could start with a regular uppercase argument, with a principal argument. So we're good all the way through here, but once we get to the negative real axis, the principal argument has a jump. So we can't have that jump. The principal argument is close to pi and then jumps to negative pi. So if we wanted to continue with the pi values, we just need to add 2 pi to the principal argument on the negative imaginary parts, and we'll be fine. And that's what we're doing right here. So we choose the argument, the regular principal argument, if the imaginary part is greater than or equal to 0. And we add 2 pi to the argument if the imaginary part is less than zero. And so that avoids this jump of the argument and we have a continuous function there. So here's a theorem. If L is a branch of logarithm, then L plus 2k pi i is the collection of all branches of logarithm in D. So once you have found a branch of logarithm, you can find all branches of logarithm in that particular domain D by just adding multiples of 2 pi i to the function that you originally found. So let's see if we can prove this. So suppose that L1 is a branch of logarithm in D. So L1 B a branch of logarithm in D. So we already know what its derivative is in that case. So we have L1 prime of z is 1 over z in D. And that's also the case for the original function L that we had found. So L is also a branch of logarithm in D. So we also know that L prime of z is 1 over z in D. So we now have two functions, L and L1, that both have the same derivative in D. And D is a connected open set, and therefore we can conclude that L1 and L only differ by a constant. So L1 is L plus some constant. So very important here, we're assuming that D is an open connected set, so it's a domain. D as in domain. All right, so the question is, why is this constant only of the form 2k pi i? Well, we know that z is equal to e to the l1 of z, but is therefore equal to e to the L of z plus c, because L1 is L plus c. And so we can pull that apart. That's e to the L of z times e to the c. e to the L of z is just z. And so z is equal to z times e to the c. The only way for that to be possible is for e to the c to be equal to 1. And we showed that can only be the case when c is of the form 2k pi i. And that shows that if you have any other branch, then it must be of this form l plus 2k pi i. Clearly, anything of the form l plus 2k pi i is also a branch of logarithm because those are also continuous functions, and e to the l plus 2k pi i is simply e to the l. All right, so this is enough for
the branches of logarithms, I have a second lecture for you that I'll record separately.